So, at what point does a coincidence become an undisputable circumstance? Could it just be a coincidence that two Houston, Texas women with the same names, same hairstyles, same body features, similar looking cars, be murdered in the same fashion, in the same area, within a similar time period, be a similar type of coincidence? Although they never met, this is what happened to two Mary Morrises back in October of 2000. And if you want to know what, 20 years later, police have still not made any connection or arrest in the murder cases of Mary Lou Henderson Morris and Mary McGinnis Morris. Greetings folks, this is Charles Goodman and I hope whoever you are, you are doing well. As you may already know, I am your host of the Area 4 AM News Podcast Network. Today we're going to talk about a case that has been making headlines across the internet. This short news podcast contains alarming content and listener discretion is advised. On the morning of October 12th, 48-year-old Mary Henderson Morris left for her job at the Chase Bank in Houston's Spring Valley. She worked there as a loan officer, and according to her husband, Jay Morris, this would be the last time he would ever see her alive. Now around 10.20 a.m., about three miles from her home, the Harris County Fire Department received a report of heavy smoke in a remote area. The fire department dismissed this report and attributed it to someone burning some leaves and they went on about their day. Later, about 5 p.m., a guy riding an ATV rolled up upon Henderson Morris's Chevy Lumina which was still smothering and smoking, and it was burnt to a crisp. The car was in an isolated area behind some trees about 100 to 150 yards off the road. Inside was a gruesome scene. Laying dead in the passenger seat was Mary Henderson Morris's burnt-up, charred body. Henderson Morris suffered a horrifying death. Her murderer had saturated her car with an accelerant and set it on fire while her body entombed inside. The fire was so intense that identifying Henderson Morris's remains was almost impossible. The medical examiner used tooth fragments from her charred corpse to confirm her identity. Pinpointing cause of time and death proved impossible. Her purse and wedding ring were missing, and robbery was suspected but dismissed after discovering that her murderer had not taken her other jewelry from the crime scene. Behind the shadows of hidden mystery, no one knows how, when, or where Henderson Moore spent the final hours of her life. The day after her murder, the Houston Chronicle newspaper got a chilling phone call. It was the voice of a man, and he said, They got the wrong Mary Morris. The man was never identified, and the call made no sense. But it would make sense to Mary Morris's daughter, Marilyn Blaylock, when she called the morgue just a few days later to inquire about her mother's jewelry. In the late afternoon, of October 12th, around 2 p.m., the phone rang at the Morris home. It was answered by Mary's husband, Jay, who said it was an employee at the bank looking for Mary. According to Jay, he told the employee that Mary was not home and was at work. Strangely, the call had ended without the employee telling Jay that Mary had never shown up for work that day, and even stranger, Jay, never asked the caller who was calling. 
Jay would later say that he became worried and called the bank to discover that Mary had never shown up for work. So Jay called his stepdaughter Marilyn, who was Mary's daughter from a previous marriage. Marilyn, who was in her early 20s at the time, was worried and raced to her mother's house. According to what she told the Murder in My Family podcast, she arrived and found that the police were there taking a missing persons report. After they left, her and her children got into Jay's truck and they made their way to the bank where Mary worked. After arriving, they saw no sign of Mary's car in the parking lot or in the parking garage. So they went back and returned to the home where her mom and her mom's husband, Jay, had lived. While there, Marilyn received a call from her biological father telling her that he was told by a friend who worked at a news station that there was a burnt-up car found on Crosby Lynchburg Road in I-10, which was about three miles away from their location. With Jay tagging along, Marilyn decided to drive because she felt that Jay was kind of putzing around, driving slow when they went to the bank or whatnot. So Jay's giving her directions, and they're driving down this two-lane road. It's about 9 in the evening, and it's getting dark. As they rolled up onto a stop sign, Marilyn saw what she thought was the I-10 overpass running above her. She asked Jay about turning to get onto I-10, but he said no and instructed her to go straight. Reluctantly, she did, and after that, they only drove for about a half of a mile where they saw a police car parked in a driveway in front of a farm gate. She couldn't see the burnt out car because it was about 150 yards off the road and behind some trees. At this point, a police officer approached the window of her car and she told him that she was searching for her missing mom. The officer informed her that they were investigating a burnt up car and he instructed her to leave the scene, wait for a call, regarding her missing mother. After returning to her mother and stepfather's house, it wasn't more than about 15 minutes when there would be a knock at the front door. And this was somebody from the sheriff's department who informed them that they believed that her mother's remains were inside of the burnt-up vehicle. According to Marilyn, Jay acted extraordinarily calm and was significantly matter-of-factly when receiving the news that his wife might have been found dead inside of her vehicle. After the funeral, Marilyn wanted to make sure that her mother was buried with her jewelry, but the funeral home told her that they did not have her jewelry. A couple of days later, Marilyn would contact the medical examiner's office and was shocked when they said to her she could pick up the jewelry once they had released her mother's body to the funeral home. When she tried to explain to a supervisor at the morgue that Mary had already been buried, they would tell her no, that they still had Mary Morris at the medical examiner's office. Now this was true because strangely, Another Mary Morris also had been murdered and found in her car just a few days later. But before we get into that, let's talk about Jay for a moment, since the husband is usually the number one suspect in a spouse's murder. According to Marilyn, she became suspicious of Jay, and she cited that Jay knew which direction to go when looking for her mother's burnt-up car. It was not on Crosby Lynchburg Road, as the news media had reported. Still strangely, Jay directed her in the right direction down Crosby Cedar Bayou. And in a chilling twist, 
Jay would later tell the sheriff's department that he had driven down the same road just that morning. He never mentioned seeing the smoke reported to the fire department at 10.20 a.m., but he did put himself close to the crime scene. Marilyn told the Murder in My Family podcast that Jay had refused to take a polygraph test and that he cited a bad experience that he had as a teenager when working for a small store where all the employees were forced to take a lie detector test after being suspected of stealing. Marilyn also said that before Mother's estate was even settled, Jay had moved on quickly. He began a courtship with a young Russian lady, and the pair were married within a year of Mary's death. At this point, the investigation would stall. Because of the fire, there was no way to determine the cause of Mary Henderson Morris's death, or even when she may have died. So... I think this will wrap it up for part one of the Who Murdered the Two Mary Morrises, the first Mary Morris podcast. Please stay tuned for part two of this podcast, where we will explore the murder of the second Mary Morris, which was Mary McGinnis Morris, who was also found dead in her car, just miles away from where Mary Henderson Morris was found. If you like what you hear here, please like and subscribe to this channel. We will take all the help we can get, and I agree that some of you will disagree with some of the things said here today. So please leave your comments below. You can also help me out by pointing out any mistakes you think I may have made in this podcast. I will also put a link down below in case you might want to visit me on Twitter. I'm Charles Goodman. And I want to thank you for joining me today. And until next time, I will see you on the flip side.